Good morning and welcome to worship. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning. We are going to be celebrating communion, um, so we encourage you to gather the elements um, that you will need so that you can participate. So you'll need some kind of bread, any kind of bread will do, even a cracker or an English muffin, um, whatever you have on hand. Also, you will need a cup of juice. If you don't have the standard grape juice, uh, any kind of juice or water, even a cup of tea will do. So we invite you to use this time as Nathan plays the prelude to gather what you need and get settled, opening to the presence of God as we move now into a time of worship. During our prelude, there will be a slideshow sharing some of the pictures from our church's celebration of the bicentennial in 1976.
Welcome all of you on this, the fifth Sunday of Pentecost and the 4th of July weekend. It is good to gather together in this time of worship to turn our attention and lift our hearts to God. So welcome those of you joining us on Facebook Live or later on Madison Public Access or on YouTube. Your presence enriches our worship and we are so glad that you are here. Know that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We hope that after worship, you will join us for our Zoom coffee hour. The link will be posted on our Facebook feed. And I'd like to call your attention to um, in two weeks on July 19th, we will be having an outdoor in-person worship service on the lawn. So we invite you to bring a blanket or bring chairs to sit on, bring your brunch or a cup of coffee. Uh, please wear a mask. We will have extras here if you forget one. Um, and if you feel more comfortable staying in your car, you can do that. Uh, you can pull up um, from Meeting House Lane. So we hope you can join us for that. It will be so good to see you in person. Also, um, after that service, the youth group will be gathering to check in with each other, have a brief game, um, and, and also see each other in person again. We want you to know that we are here for you, so please do not hesitate to reach out to either Todd or myself if we can walk with you through this time in any way. And now, friends, I invite you to take a few deep and slow breaths and ground yourselves in the presence of God. This morning, Avery Belcher will be playing um, the piano for our introit. So I invite you to settle in um, as Avery plays us further into our time of worship. <laughs> Let us join together now in a spirit of prayer. 
Holy God, you gather us in this weekly rhythm of worship, your spirit at work among us, shaping us into your people. Be present to us now as we make ourselves present to you. Help us to open our minds, our hearts, our deepest selves to your transforming touch. Move among us to heal and forgive, to lead and teach, to renew and shape us more and more into your people, living your love in each moment of our days. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. In this moment, in our time of worship, we reflect on passing the peace to those around us. And whether that is the people you see in the grocery store throughout the week, or the people in your home, or wherever you are, may we all be the peace to one another. Let us take a moment to pass the peace. Peace be with you. Good morning, and peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you all. Peace, Peace, Peace be, be with, with you. you. This morning's scripture comes from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31, and I invite various members of the congregation into our virtual space to share the scripture. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Suppose the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
Suppose the ear were to say, because I am not an I, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, how could it hear? If the whole body were hearing, how could it smell? But as it is, God arranged each limb and organ in the body as he chose. If all were a single member, there would be no body at all. As it is, there are many different members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, much more necessary are the members of the body that seem weaker, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and the parts we are modest about are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has blended the body together, giving the greater honor to the humbler parts, that there may be no dissension and division within the body but the members may have the same care and mutual concern for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member flourishes, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has assigned in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracle workers, then gracious gifts of healing, ministries of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak different tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Years ago, for um, no reason that I can remember, I decided to purchase season tickets to the Portland Symphony Orchestra, uh, maybe because in my mid-twenties I came to recognize that, that my life had a serious shortage of anything that might be called cultural who knows. Uh, because I've never been especially fond or particularly knowledgeable about classical music, I'm not really sure why I did it, but I did. And for anyone who knows anything at all, who has ever experienced um, an orchestra playing a symphony, there is certainly something to seeing it live that, 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 that gets missed, I think, when you just listen to it um, on your computer. And one of the first times I went to the Arlene Schnitzer Concert Hall to see the Portland Symphony play, I got there early. I wasn't really sure when things started or you know, when you had to get there. So I got there about half an hour early and they were just sort of setting the stage for the performance. Uh, kind of the, the, the people were moving out chairs and setting them up and rolling out the harp and, and, and the kettle drums. And, and so I sat there and I watched the whole thing kind of being assembled piece by piece. And then after everything had been laid out one by one, sometimes in sections, uh, the, the musicians would come out themselves and make their way through kind of the maze of chairs and, and find their place and they'd take out their, their music, look at their notes, chat a little bit with their neighbors. And all of this is going on as preparation for what is obviously going to come. And then they began to warm up. And that is the thing, honestly, that I remember most vividly was 85, maybe 90 different people sort of plucking at their strings or doing whatever it is people do with their elbows, um, tooting their horns. And I, 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 I just remember this so vividly because, again, and some of you will have this experience, right? It's such discord and cacophony. It doesn't seem to make any sense. It's just these random sounds and noises coming from these distinct and separate people just sitting together. Now again, 
all of this is in preparation and anticipation for something that will come, something that is sublime in its beauty when it's done well. It's this expression of harmony that symphonies can give us that have the power to move our spirits. I may not have liked classical music before I purchased those tickets, but I, I have sense. Um, and, and every time I go, every time I have uh, the opportunity to see an orchestra play, I like to get there early because I love to see the warm-up. This idea of discord and cacophony sort of finding its harmony, its rhythm, getting in tune together, right, for the performance. But it only does this because of the commitment of each individual musician to lend their unique, extraordinary skill to the expression of the entire orchestra, the orchestra as a whole. The word symphony itself comes from a much older Greek word, uh, symphonos, uh, itself a blending of the root syn for a concordant and the, the word phonos for sound or noise. So symphony is simply concordant sound. It seems obvious to say at this point that, that symphony is an apt metaphor, an apt image for the church, sometimes a cacophony of different voices, a diverse gathering of unique gifts blended with shared experience and common, hopefully, common purpose. As Paul writes in his letter to the church in Corinth, all the members of the church comprise one body, all with their own individual and particular gifts and talents, but all dependent upon one another for fullness of function, for fullness of life. Now, as obvious as a metaphor as the symphony may be for the church, I suspect it might be helpful to us this morning as a reminder of how every community seeks to function as well. This might be especially appropriate given that it is the 4th of July weekend, the weekend that commemorates the birth of a new expression of human freedom, at least new to the Western European and North American experience. In Jefferson's words, this new expression of freedom held that certain truths are self-evident, inevitable, that all of us are created equal, all of us are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you took the time this weekend to read further, you would see that the bulk of the declaration is a searing indictment of, of the crimes of King George III, but we stick the first part, because that's what's important to us. Now, I don't know if, if Jefferson imagined this new polity springing forth uh, along the eastern seaboard of North America as symphonic or not, probably not. But over the course of the last 240 some odd years, that is what we have worked and struggled to approach. Not a cacophony of discordant voices, but a concordant sound, a common song in which every voice is lifted up. All of this came up yesterday in conversation with uh, Sarah's father, my father-in-law, who is both a statistician and a, a classically trained uh, bass vocalist. Bass, right? Not baritone, bass. Bass vocalist. So in our conversation, uh, Lynn mentioned um, a former teacher of his, a, 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 a man named Roger Nirenberg, who left choral conducting many years ago to begin work in business consulting. And he uses this fascinating practice. He goes to a town where he is going to do some consulting work. He finds a group of classically trained musicians. He brings them together, um, rehearses for a little while, and then he will bring in, um, he'll bring in leaders from a particular business or organization he's working with, and he'll have them sit in various parts of this sort of makeshift symphony. And the purpose behind all this is to understand that every organization struggles to find harmony. Every community, every polity struggles to find that sense of balance and harmony. And what he tries to do, uh, Mr. Nirenberg, is to have people sit, maybe the sales manager sit in one section of, 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 the, of the orchestra, and he'll have that section of the orchestra intentionally do something discordant. So that when the, entire, when the entire orchestra is playing, if the, if the woodwind section is playing out of tune, it'll become very easy for people to hear that. The understanding is that the sales force cannot be out of tune with research and development uh, or finance. And in order for an organization to find its full 
sense of harmony. Everyone has to be playing in tune together. Now this whole idea of a symphony as a model for business invites a new appreciation for the idea of harmony. And it's, intended, it's attendant virtue of unity of purpose. By setting leaders within a practicing symphony, Nirenberg is able to show the potential for discord in an organization of any kind if one section of an orchestra plays too loud or out of tune with the rest of the group. Discordant sound soon leads to dissonance and division. It's very much like the problem that Paul confronts in his letter to the Christian community in the Greek city of Corinth. Now this Christian community was founded by Paul himself probably in the years around 51 or 52 AD. He stayed with them for more than a year, building what to all appearances was a rigorous and vibrant community. And for that whole year, he talked to them about the unifying power of God's grace manifested in Jesus, the crucified and risen Lord. He preached and he pleaded with them to set aside non-essential distinctions it didn't matter whether you were born a Jew or a pagan Greek, whether you were a woman or a man, whether you were rich or poor, enslaved or free. In Christ, in Christ, you are all gathered as equal parts of the body. Unified by one baptism, your common life affirmed each time you gathered in the sharing of a sacred meal. It was, in a very real sense, a declaration of independence for the church members in Corinth, a story of God's love to liberate them from the restraints of an incredibly repressive and brutalizing and dehumanizing culture. And then he left. He left to carry the gospel to other places. And after he left, left to their own devices, the Corinthians quickly reverted to their old habits, their old beliefs, and their old practices. Rather than celebrating communion as a common meal, the wealthier members of the church began to exclude poorer ones and simply gathered together for a richer, larger meal. Rather than understand that every member was of equal importance, some members elevated themselves above the rest, claiming that they possessed greater spiritual gifts and greater spiritual insights. Where Paul had preached equality, the Corinthians were reverting to hierarchy. Arguments ensued. Life in Corinth quickly fell into discord and division. And Paul hears about it. So he writes back to them to remind them of their foundational virtues of harmony and accord and equality. He does not encourage, it must be said, any sense of conformity. Read this chapter from 1 Corinthians, and you see that Paul understands that diversity is a virtue. It is a human reality. We all bring different gifts. We all serve as different parts of the body. Paul understands that we are not all the same, not conformed to one particular vision of what is valuable and what is not. What Paul says is that in that diversity comes a great harmony of human community, of human existence. Every person is unique. Every person is endowed by God with certain gifts, talents, knowledge, and passion. It is the work of a harmonious society to bring all of those gifts, to raise them all to one common voice. Paul insists that his brothers and sisters in Corinth understand that Christian life is marked not by independence alone, by the discord of competing voices and private privilege, but by interdependence, by interdependence. The willingness to see the blessing of every gift from every person, the acknowledgement that we need one another to survive. Paul is clear as a bell on this. Human beings have need of one another and have need of everything 
we bring to our common life. Years ago, I was struck by a quote from Mario Cuomo, public life, he wrote, public life requires at least two things, an insistence on personal responsibility and a recognition that we are all a part of a community. From our neighborhoods to the global community to the planet itself, everything we see tells us that while individualism may be all American, it is not all that Americans need. Again, this weekend, we typically celebrate, commemorate, and remember that first supreme expression of American public life. We are all created equal, but in order for equality to flourish, we need one another. And so we have to live against the tide of discourse and division, excuse me, discord and division, against the impulse to claim private rights that distort the common good, wear a face mask for the love of all things holy. Seek harmony, and finally be in tune with what Paul calls at the end of this reading a still more excellent way. It is hard at times to take readings from Paul's letters in small doses, right? Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians as a single piece intended perhaps to be read as a whole to the gathered assembly of all the people. They should hear it together with its praise and also with its criticism, its concerns for the present balanced against a soaring hope for what God will come. This passage we heard this morning reflecting Paul's concern for harmony and accord anticipates what will come. Paul's resounding hymn to the quality and effect of love. If you've ever been to a wedding, you in all likelihood will know this passage from 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not boastful or arrogant or irritable. It doesn't rejoice in what is wrong, but rejoices in what is right. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We imagine a bride and a groom, or a groom and a groom, or a bride and a bride standing together hearing these words. But taken out of that context, they are instructional for any gathering of people who seek a common purpose and a common life. Because 1 Corinthians 13 is not simply a catalog of what love is. It reminds the church and the society to which the church is called to speak of what love does. It gathers and unifies. It brings harmony where there is potential discourse and division. It tempers anger and resentment. It allows for distinction and difference but imagines a greater unity, a greater harmony in which multiple voices are raised up, multiple hopes expressed, multiple yearnings finding fulfillment. In the end, for Paul, love is the one thing that saves us because it is only love that allows us to open up the center of our own lives to the presence of others and to see in their hopes acknowledge the fulfillment of all God hopes for us and from us as well. Happy Fourth. Thanks be to God. Amen. God is present and active through all our days. And so we offer our gratitude for the many ways that our lives are touched by grace. In addition to the financial offerings we give to support the ministries of our church, 
we lift up the many ways, large and small, that we offer our very selves, our time, our love, our joys, and our prayers. So here now is a video offering from Vanessa Ballantyne and Sarah C. Hewson. Good morning, I'm Vanessa Ballantyne. And I'm Sarah C. Hewson. We work together on one of the Loving Your Neighbor projects, an outreach project for church members. I contacted many of the folks on the Lay Caring team. And I was in touch with people who have younger families or youth with the church. We were absolutely amazed at the generosity of people. We received so many goodies. Oh my gosh, cookies, muffins, breads, spreads, you name it, <laughs> we <laughs> received it. <laughs> and we had such fun on a Friday afternoon, tying them up like little packages to give to our church friends. And we decided to add a little card and one of the youth at our church, Andrew, um, drew a picture of the church and we sent that along with the, the goodies. One cute story that uh, came from the package that we sent was somebody was so impressed with his drawing that he decided to frame it and hang it next to the war hall that they have in their home. We thought that was kind of cool. Absolutely. We got so many greetings and examples of gratitude with please come in for a visit, we'll set up a time to get together. And it became very clear that people really need to see each other and need the human touch, the smile. Even in this pandemic, we've gotten separated, but I think we worked together and saw. It was a chance for us to connect with people, even though we had to stay afar from um, a distance. It was absolutely an opportunity for us to be loving towards our neighbors. We would like to end this in prayer, so if you could take a minute to fold your hands. Thank you, God, for grace of community at work in our own town and the opportunity to be part of it and be with the people as Jesus directed his disciples. Amen. We move now to a time of prayer. And as we do so, I invite you to feel your love and concern for those people and situations for whom you would pray. God is love and is at work in love. So an important step in prayer is connecting with our love for one another and the world. In these moments, as Nathan plays the organ and we sink into prayer, I invite you to type into the Facebook feed the prayers that rise within you so that we can lift them up together. Holy God, we are grateful for the beauty of the world, for the adventure of being alive, and for your love that sustains us through the highs and lows of each new day. Draw us near to you, soften us in your presence, and be at work in us as we pray. We lift to you our love and concern for all those on our prayer list this morning. We pray for Pat, Mary, Catherine, Willie, Jim, David, Sharon, and Keith. We pray for Bob and Diane, Stephanie, Ethan, Carol, David, Jody, and Aileen. 
Oh God, be with Patty, Jan, Donna, David, Seymour, and Linnea, Deborah, Lynn, Robert, Mickey, John, Patty, and Carol. And we offer prayers of comfort and condolence for the friends and family of Quint Noyes, who passed away last week. Holy One, we continue our prayers during this pandemic for, for all who are sick, for all who have lost loved ones, and for all those working on the front lines to care for and serve others. We lift up those who have lost jobs, homes, a sense of security in this tumultuous time. Lead us, we pray, and use us, O oh God, to come together to work in harmony, to get through this together. On this 4th of July weekend, when our usual celebrations have been halted, help us to reflect on a deeper level on where we are as a country and where we want to be. We are an unfinished nation, and we pray for the continued struggle to live into the ideals we hold of freedom from oppression and the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all people. In your great love, guide and shape our living. Help us to rise to this moment. Lead us to do the hard work of listening and learning from others, of repentance and reconciliation, of creating and being the beloved community you work to shape in the world. We offer as well, O oh God, prayers for all, all those who struggle to find you and connect with you and a sense of deep abiding in your presence. We pray for Carly Ann, and we lift up all the prayers that reside, God, in the silent sanctuary of our hearts. All these things and more we pray in the holy name of Christ. Amen. Beloved of God, as we come to this, the welcome table of God, we continue this journey of being in communion with one another even as we remain at safe distance. We continue to find ways of being the church together in new ways, unaccustomed ways of celebrating the sacrament so, separate, so, excuse me, so central to our common life. And we remind ourselves at this table that no matter where we are, no matter what form the bread and cup before us takes, no matter whose company we are in, in this moment at this table, we are drawn into communion with God and with one another, into a fellowship of grace that knows no boundaries, that bridges all distance, that gathers us into one company, one body to be broken, blessed, and sent out to be bread for a hungry world. Here at this table, dear friends, the space between heaven and earth becomes thin, and we taste together what might be possible in the world around us, that being both gathered and distance does not inhibit us from sharing the love and the grace of God together. Let us pray. Holy One, we are guests at your table, stewards of the grace that gathers us children awaiting the nourishment that will fuel us for lives of love and compassion. As we share in this meal today, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and cup. 
Make them be for us a holy mystery that unites us in communion with you and with one another. Bind our hopes with those of all your people as we seek to pour ourselves out in love as the body of Christ in the world. We pray in the name of Christ, lifting up our voices together. Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Every time that we gather at this table, we remember that on the final night of his life, Jesus gathered at supper with his closest disciples in the upper room in the house in Jerusalem, and he knew what was to follow. He knew that after that evening, their community would no longer be as it once was. That division and discord, violence would interrupt their life together. But he also knew that in this meal, he promised something eternal and everlasting. A grace that would nourish the people of God from that point until this one. So we gather as they did, struggling with the realities of life around us, struggling with challenges and concerns within our own lives. But we come now to this table, to this bread, knowing that in this meal we are gathered. So he took that bread knowing all that would follow. And he gave it to them and said, Take, eat of this, all of you. This is my body which is broken for you. Each time you gather, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, at the supper, Jesus took the cup. And he blessed it and he gave it to them. And he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. Beloved, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God, no matter where you are. This meal brings us together into communion. Let us join our voices together in our prayer of thanksgiving. We give you thanks, bestower of all good gifts, for the blessing of this table, for the reminder of our connection to you and to one another. In this simple meal, out of a scattered and distanced people, you gather and create your church. Through the bread broken and blessed, the cup poured out and shared. You invest us with faith and courage, hope and resolve to be servants of your good news. As we leave this table, send us out as your servants to be bread for a world that hungers for justice and for peace. Amen. Amen.
So when we come in to worship, in whatever form that takes with us these days, it's helpful sometimes to think of that as the warm-up. That time when we come from different places, out of different circumstances, some of us with joy, some of us with sorrow, some of us somewhere in between. And we come into this space and we hear this story. And then we're invited to leave this place again and to carry a part of that story with us, a piece of that story with us. So as you turn off your screens and you go into your various lives and into the world that is out there, go with that peace that will bring you harmony, accord, that will allow you in love to listen to whatever voice is speaking to you this week. May that peace also bring you a sense of God's love that is always a still more excellent way. Amen. Amen.